Um, my name is Johannes Schmid, or just call me Joe. Everybody calls me Joe. I am the uh, lead dev of the JavaScript API 3D team in the R&D center in Zurich. And um, this session is going to be split in two parts. First of all, Sean here will tell you uh, some information about how you can get point clouds and integrated mesh data, how you can bring it into the RJS platform and process and publish it. And then in the second half, I'm going to talk to you about how you can bring it into the JavaScript API and work with it there. Like, what, what can you do in the JavaScript API with the data? OK? Thank you, Joe. My name is Sean Marsh. I work in the Redlands office. I'm a product engineer for the 3D team. And as Joe said, I'll be going through the initial how do you create scene services, what are scene services, if you haven't any idea what they are or what you saw this morning enticed you and excited you and you want to try that out. So uh, I've covered the full workflow for all of the different layer types uh, and then show you some of the results and then I'll hand over to Joe. I'll, we'll stop for questions in, at, between us and then uh, we'll have an opportunity to see what Joe can do then with the uh, published scene services. All right, so let's go get started. So the, the whole idea of scene services and uh, the API is to integrate all of the 3D capabilities for ArcGIS across the platform, so both online and also in desktop in Pro. Uh, and also it's, it's scalable, so you can handle everything from a small single building up to city scale. So we have a data for New York where we have over a million buildings in, th in 3D, like 3D objects. Uh, we also have a, work with some data sets which are 60 billion LiDAR data points. Uh, and you'll see some of that and you can see that it's very performant and works very well and you're able to do some nice visualization and also some analysis as well. So the various scene layers, we have the 3D object scene layer, which is a, on desktop you would call it a, a multi-patch. We have a point scene layer, which is a point which has been uh, actually symbolized and then we have what we'll be talking about mostly here today are the integrated mesh and point cloud scene layer. So point cloud comes out of, well, it doesn't necessarily have to come out of LiDAR. It can be any large point cloud. So if you have NetCDF or Bathy data, those are also considered point clouds as well. And then on the bottom, the, what all of this overlays is an elevation layer. So any of you who've looked at either Globe or Pro, or uh, ArcGIS Online, the underlying terrain is a elevation service. It's the world elevation service. And if you want to do any custom applications or do increase the resolution of the data that you're working with, it's good to have your own custom elevation to do that. And you'll see why as we, we, we work our way through. And that, is, that can be published also from uh, either desktop or from Pro and it's what's known as a LERC, L-E-R-C, image service. And that can be hosted either on Portal or on G ArcGIS Online. So a quick run through of what I3S is. So this is the back end. This is what uh, supports scene layers. It, this is, I3S is a open uh, indexed scene service and a description of how all of that can be put together is, uh, is available on the GitHub. So it's, a, it's under OGC consideration for a community standard. So it's, it's not just going to be a proprietary format. It is open and, and available to, for users and developers to work with as well. So if you have your own data, you can create a cooker that will uh, cook out scene layer packages. So what type of content do we generate? So we de generate points and multi-patches, integrated mesh. So integrated mesh, there are three 
producers of integrated mesh at this time. So desktop or pro do not create integrated mesh. Drone to map, which is a photogrammetric, uh, auto mosaic, DSM, uh, point cloud and mesh generation piece of software uses uh, the, it, it's the Esri solution to produce integrated mesh. Uh, Bentley Context Capture creates it and also so does uh, Pix4D. So those are primarily imagery, uh, photogrammetric data capture tools and they generate uh, integrated mesh. Point clouds. Point clouds can be anything from LiDAR, NetCDF, or photogrammetric point clouds as well. Uh, we're focusing primarily at this release on LiDAR. So we consume anything that is uh, in the last format, so 1.1 to 1.4. And then any of the, those formats, they need to be um, ordered in an LASD, so a a, um, the ArcGIS Pro LASD uh, format, uh, and then they can be consumed, and then output as an S SLPK. And then point symbols, and then some analytics, they're also covered in the, in the, in the specification as well. So I'll go from talking about just what we're, we're doing to actually giving you some demonstration. So in Pro, oh, sit down. So in Pro we have, uh, as I said earlier, we have, we have the, oh, too loud. We have the different formats. So this is a 3D object. So these are multi-patches with textures cooked into them. And these, this is a multi-patch geodatabase on, uh, on, on locally. We also, as I said, support points. We support symbolized points. Uh, then we also support point, point layers with symbology. Uh, and then on the, uh, on the upside of it as well, so we also support all of those together. But also with the point cloud. So this is a LiDAR data set of point clouds for this particular area, which is in Portland, Oregon. And point clouds have not just, they're not just the points themselves, but they also have symbology. So, Based on the classification, you can, you can determine what is ground and then what are buildings. And then in ArcGIS Pro, you also have tools now to, to do some changes in symbology and changes in classification. So you can actually edit. So if you want to increase or edit the point clouds to be able to extract information out of them, you can actually edit the classification interactively so you get a better result out of your out of your point cloud set. So we not only support so one of the things that we get asked a lot is do we support not just global scenes or not just global but also local? So this is a local scene of the same area uh, with the same set of data but which has been projected to NAT83, state plane, um, with uh, vertical, vertical units are in feet. So as against the vertical units being in meters in the global scene. So, I'll show you the, so we have, so it's state plane and it's feet international. So we have, a point, we have a point clouds here also. And then as I said, for the integrated mesh, where do we get integrated meshes and what do they look like? So 
This is a set of data provided uh, by um, the Spanish mapping agency, and it's uh, created from Bentley's context capture, and it has the it has the mesh of the actual buildings and shapes of the buildings, and also the trees, anything that is uh, been captured by the photo. So all all of the different all of the different layers are, are right there in one big piece. So that that's what what a, a the integrated mesh looks like. And then for the point clouds, why would you want to use integrated mesh and not point clouds, or why would you want to use point clouds over integrated mesh? So as you saw in, the, in this example, the uh, buildings are a little bit melty. They're a bit like a wedding cake. They're not quite sharp. You don't have the sharp angles of the sides of the buildings. They're good for, for context. Uh, and that's exactly what a lot of uh, engineering firms are using it for. They use it to capture how things are right now at this moment. But if they want to do any engineering work, they will actually capture uh, the data with, with LiDAR. So here we have the downtown Orlando, and much sharper, but also still a little bit wedding cake-ish. So for this, we also have three different sets of LiDAR data. We have airborne LiDAR, mobile LiDAR, and terrestrial LiDAR. And the differences with these are, uh, one is the density of the points, two is the area coverage. So with, uh, with LiDAR, you're, you're limited to line of sight. So if it can't be seen by the scanner, it doesn't show up in your point cloud. So this is kind of the, the mix or the best way of capturing everything at, at highest scale. So with the, uh, with the airborne, you can see that it is capturing a much more dense area. And then as you add the mobile, the sides of the buildings are added in, and then with the terrestrial, you actually get the what is in what is on the ground as well. So, in this in these scenes, you can actually query and do measurements. So in Pro, you can actually uh, gather information where uh, features are. And you can also do measurements of, of actual where features, where features sit. Now, to generate or to turn this into something that can be published online, we use a GP tool called Create Scene Layer. So what we're doing is we're creating a, a scene layer package which indexes the point cloud data set and then packages it up into a zip file. And that zip file contains not only the indexed data but also a JSON file which allows it to be read by WebGL and then um, all of the work that Joseph will do was, was, is enabled by that. So to do that, I'll just run through quickly on a smaller data set how you would do that. So this is the Portland data, quite small. Uh, we'll go to call up, create scene layer. And create scene layer, create scene layer will create a scene layer package for all of the features in this service. So the, the, the 3D objects, the trees, the buildings, and the, uh, the LiDAR points. But we're just going to create it for the LiDAR. Uh, we pick an output. Uh, 
and it asks us as it asks us what projection we wish to output it in. So this is with LiDAR data and with a lot of 3D data, it's very important now to define both not only the horizontal coordinates, but also the vertical coordinates. A lot of LiDAR data is captured in ellipsoidal, so anybody who's flown a drone and captured the imagery and used the GPS, they'll find that their, their data is either floating above, miles above the ground, or buried deep within it because those units use ellipsoidal vertical coordinate systems as against the globe, which is um, using, uh, is, has a different coordinate system. So you need to be able to switch between the two. So we're just going to pick WGCS and then run that output. And that runs quite quickly, so it took 10 seconds. And then we want to be able to publish it. So to publish an SLPK, you want to either have a enterprise, ArcGIS enterprise, so that is portal, server, data store for an on-premise environment, uh, and this is so these SLPKs are supported in 10.4.1 for 3D objects and integrated meshes, 10.5 for point symbols, 3D objects, integrated meshes, and point clouds. And also, these are all natively supported now in ArcGIS Online. So to add this item and, and publish it, we use the add item, we choose the file, we give it a tag, and then we add the item. So what's happening now is, is that that SLPK is being uploaded to, our, to the ArcGIS Online environment, and as it, once it is being uploaded, it will be unpacked and placed within the, the content page. Uh, and uh, when that is done, it, you'll be able to, Joe will be able to then do the necessary work with it on, uh, in, in uh, the Arctis Online environment. And give it a moment. So while it's doing that, Go back and look at. So it's the same for, for the integrated meshes. They can also be, so if you have drone to map, there's a publishing process, and it automatically will push to ArcGIS Online. The only issue you need to be aware of is that if you have a very, very large data set that you output, so anything over one gig, uh, ArcGIS Online will not or accept it because it's too big. And there's a tool here which is called Share. So it's Share Package. And what that does is it allows you to connect to your portal or ArcGIS Online instance, upload your SLPK. You then need to publish that from ArcGIS Online but it gives you the option of, of loading really, really large data sets. So I've uploaded 250 gig point cloud data sets, so that works quite well. And so we go back and see what's happened. So it's now published. We just open the service. And this is the same service online and available to, so as I, it'll publish it with the rendering that I set in the, uh, in Pro. Uh, the, you, if you have other data, like RGB data in your point clouds, that, that can also be, you can set it to render that. 
And so, so we now have point clouds. We can add our other data. So now we've got our trees, as well as our points. And you can see the performance is quite good. So just to give you an idea of how big a data set you can actually load. This is LiDAR data from the county of Sonoma in Northern California. It has RGB classification and elevation information in it. It's 60 billion points, two terabytes of raw last data, um, and it covers, it's, covers a large county area in Northern California. So I've set up the renders, so we have elevation, classification, uh, RGB, and then we were able to render the RGB and actually the points for each of the at ground level. And you can see, as you can see here in the background, we have the elevation of the World Elevation Service is poking through. So if you want to be able to, you know, get really, really good uh, resolution on your in your lidar in your point cloud and with your features it's always good to have that custom digital elevation model underlying that yeah. so you, you can not only view this in the online environment, but you can also take, the, take this scene what you put, that you publish and you can bring it back into Pro. So I just open another empty scene. I'll go to my projects. I'll go to, uh, this is portal for all services and find a service from the city of New York. And I can add this I can add this to ArcGIS Pro. And the, the value of doing this is that you are pulling down published services that are, that are hosted on ArcGIS Online. All of the, the features in this particular case are hosted on ArcGIS Online. Um, as you can see here, I have the 3D buildings for the city and also building heights. So I have a number of different feature services running in ArcGIS Online. And if I want, I can change this to a different class. So I'm changing it to the classification. And then I can actually turn around and I can share it back out using the web scene, publish web scene. So what we'll do is it already populates all of the uh, necessary information, puts in all the tags, and then it allows you to push that back up to the, to the web as well. So that's, that's one way of doing the changes of, in a web scene. Uh, but Joe will show you now how to use the API to do programmatic changes to either LiDAR or the integrated mesh or 
whatever else there may be on there that you have in your service. All right, Joe. Uh, actually, we said, like, if you have any questions about that okay. part, uh, let's talk about them right now so you don't forget. And then uh, we go ahead to the JavaScript part, then we can talk about, have questions for the JavaScript part. So any questions for Sean? Are you aware of any tools to extract RGB values out of a photo and insert into last data? There are, well, there are a number, well, there's two that I know of. Uh, one is in, from last tools okay. uh, from Rapid Lasso. Uh, we also have a tool which allows you to do that as well. The only issue, it makes last look really nice. The only problem is, is that the difference between the data capture for the photogrammetric information and the LiDAR information, you can, even if it's a couple of months, yeah. you know, you can have leaf off or leaf on. Right. It can make a, a huge difference. The Sonoma data was captured with a, uh, a, a was captured with a unit which actually captured RGB values. So early, you know, 2005 forward to about 2014, most of that data doesn't have RGB values. Yeah. There, are, there are ways of overlaying um, RGB information, but you know, you're, it looks good. That's the main thing yeah, about right. it. Yeah. Same question, pretty much. I was wondering oh, how we did okay. that. Yeah. Yeah. Any other? Yeah. Oh. Um, is there any support for making measurements inside a web scene with the point cloud? <laughs> Joe's the man to talk to there. So uh, for, for, so the, just before Joe answers, the, in the SLPK, so in the I3S standard, all of the features, so any, so when you publish an object, a 3D object, a point class, or a a point cloud class, the data, all of the attribution gets packaged up and sent with it. So in the 3D objects at this time, you can actually query the 3D buildings in WebScene. For point clouds, that is a functionality that is coming. And Joe is, will be the person who will be building the, that are working with the, the measurement tools in the WebScene. So yeah, not there yet, uh, we'll come. I mean, I actually have one demo, like you can kind of make it work by coding it yourself, but we are definitely planning and working on a really nice measurement tool that you can use in any kind of data, in the scene viewer and also in the API. Any other questions before Joe fires up? Hello, can you hear me? All right, cool. So um, I'm gonna dive right in. So now you've, you've put your point class, your integrated meshes on uh, ArcGIS Enterprise or ArcGIS Online. And um, Sean has already showed you that you can load it in the scene viewer. Now the question is how, like if you create your own applications with the JavaScript API, how can you load the data and how can you interact with it? So uh, for, I'm gonna do point clouds first, uh, integrated meshes second. Point clouds, we have, actually for both data types, we have a specific layer type. So if you've already worked with 3D objects or points, um, there's one layer for those called scene layer that will work for either points or for 3D objects. For point clouds and for integrated meshes, we've created specific uh, layer type. So if you want to uh, use point cloud data, you have to create one of these point cloud layers. And they only work in 3D at the moment. So that, that means they only work with a scene view. If you attach a map view to it, you will see nothing. The map view will not consume that layer. Uh, the functionality that we support currently for point cloud layers in the JavaScript API is the basic like display and explore, essentially what the scene viewer does when, uh, when, when Sean just demoed it, demoed it to you. Um, we can 
assign and change all of the rendering options. So that means we can uh, de define the colors based on data, based on elevations, and some other visualization options that I will talk about in a second. And, and there's some simple user interaction that's possible uh, with the click event and the hit test. And this is also how you can do some simple form of measurement already if you really need it. So I'm going to talk. Actually, let me uh, show a first brief demo. Just, uh, just so, OK, so how does that work, how you do it? This is a very basic application. Um, if you work with the JavaScript API, you've seen this before. We need some, some styles. And then we're going to uh, add in the, the JavaScript API um, source in the script. And then uh, require all kind of bunch of things that we need here. We need the point cloud layer, most specifically. But here's the meat of it. Um, here's where, I, where we create a point cloud layer. And there's always two ways in which you can create a layer. You can either give it a portal item ID. So this is when you're, when you're in the portal in the item page, you can see this long, long item ID. You can just use that and plug it into the layer constructor here. The other option, and I have an example of that later, is you can also put the rest endpoint in there in case that you work with that and, and you have that. All right, so I'm, I've, I'm creating this point cloud layer, and then I create a new web scene um, and assign that layer to be the one and only layer in my web scene, apart from a base map and, and the ground. This here defines that I want to use the, the Esri uh, 3D elevation service to define the terrain surface. And finally, I create the, uh, or we create a scene view, uh, tell it that this is the scene that we want to use, and some initial camera configuration. So doing that gives you the basic functionality, this like display and explore, um, as, as we've seen before. All right. Oops. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is the renderers and the, the, the styling. Uh, there's, in the API, there's four different renders. That's probably what, what's available in Pro as well. I think we have a one-to-one -one feature parity there. There's the RGB render, the stretch render, which is essentially a color ramp render, a uh, unique value render, which is assigns one color to uh, unique, like, each value that you get in the, in the data set. And then class breaks render, where you can essentially create the classes yourself based on a range of values. Um, point cloud, uh, the RGB render first, um, this is very simple. Uh, it just takes the RGB value that is stored in the data set and uses that for the point color. But this means, this means that you actually have to have RGB values in there. If you use a point cloud render and you don't have it, you'll just see white points. And that's, it's not very helpful. You won't actually see anything. Uh, there's not many options here. All you need to specify, do is uh, specify the field name, which is RGB by default. Stretch render, uh, as I said, this is um, coloring the points based on a color ramp. So the first thing you can do is pick an attribute, pick a field. And here I've picked the elevation, so that means you will color by the, by the height of the point. The elevation is actually not like a, a like GIS-like feature attribute. This is kind of a shortcut. This is really saying just take the C value, the Z value of the point, and, create, and, and color the point based on that. So you can color by height. You could color by return intensity value. Or if you have any custom data um, in, the, in the last data set, you can also create a color ramp based on that. So yeah, after picking the field, you can define all of these steps. So this means um, all values at minus 0 0.78 and below will be colored with that color. And all values between, zero, between minus 0 0.78 and 1 will be colored with that color. Sorry, there will be a ramp, like a, a linear transition from that color to that color as the value goes from minus 0 0.78 to 1, and so on. So let's take a look at how that looks like. So here I've, I've just, just copied that snippet essentially and let's can execute that. And now you can see this is coloring the, uh, the points by elevation. And I mean, what's not so nice here, for example, is that the top of the lighthouse here is all gray. This is because the sort of the last value that, that I define in my ramp is way too low. So I can go ahead and change that to 
maybe 40 and rerun the script and now we can see the color comes further up and probably even take some more. Um, so you can, you can tune the, uh, the stretch render like that. All right, next render is uh, the class breaks render. Um, here you define ranges of values, of, of continuous values, um, that where one map, one, like each of these range maps to a single value. Uh, this is just like class breaks render for features. Actually, you're probably all familiar with that. So I have a, another sample here for that. Actually, uh, this is the, the demo I, I did this morning in the, uh, in the plenary. Uh, can just explore that a little more. So again, the story is that uh, we have the, the point cloud of, the, of um, Central Park, and maybe we need the, all the vegetation to stay below a certain value. And obviously, I mean, point cloud is, I guess, one of the most inexpensive ways to acquire and, and, and process data because it doesn't require a lot of processing. It's essentially what you get from LiDAR. So it's, you can do this fairly often, so it's easy to stay up to, up to date, I guess. Um, so again, this class breaks render assigns uh, green color to anything that's between minus 145 meters, uh, yellow color between 45 and 50 meters, and red color between 50 and, and 500. So this is essentially just ma maxing out. And another use case for that, um, could actually be, if you're interested, I hope I, I can find actually an interesting uh, place here. So if you're, if you're interesting, interested in if the water level would rise, like which parts would be underwater, which parts would be over water, let me just try to briefly set up a different class based render here that maybe is, goes to four meters and then four meters to 500 meters. Um, so this is green and red now. Now you can see all of the Oh, actually, that's the wrong way around, I guess. Let me switch the colors. All right. Uh, so now everything that is in green is above that sort of fictional line that we had in mind. So if the, if the sea level would rise by four meters, it would look like that. Uh, you, can, you can go in and explore what are the areas that would, would be over water, what are the areas that would still be underwater. All right, and then finally, there's a unique value render, which um, is that the, the, the main point of it is that when you have pre-classified data into, uh, into ground vegetation buildings, anything else, I guess, I'm, to be honest, I'm not so familiar with the last data set. I think there's a, is there a standard classification, standard classification code? Okay. Yep, yeah. so in, in the last classification, there are, you know, there, yeah, there's a set of class codes, and the, the data doesn't come classified. It has to be classified by you or custom classified. So it, it helps to do the rendering. So if you just want to see ground, or if you wish to see just what's vegetation, uh, a very good way of, of doing that is just use the class code to filter out that particular set of data. Uh, I've seen it used where trees have been filtered out and then they've been placed in a scene which has buildings so the actual it's realistic uh, for the tree what the trees actually look like as against some symbol which is a representation of those trees as well so you can do things like uh, filter out trees and then see how close they come to canneries or to overhead wires and things like that as well so cool yeah so but apart from that like the render um, in the JavaScript API doesn't care so much about the, the standardization. You can pick any field here, and then you can define any specific values that you want to map to a specific color. All right, so, so these are the different kind of coloring modes that you have for, render, uh, for renders. Now, all of these renders have uh, an, uh, two properties, essentially, uh, that you can use to define how many points that you see and how large the points are on screen. Um, so this is the same for all four renders. Uh, the first one, this is points per inch. Um, so the, 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 the scene layer, the point cloud scene layer, th the moment that you create the SLPK in Pro, it will generate um, levels of detail. So it will generate different representations of the data. Just like we, we, we probably know image pyramids, it kind of 
creates a pyramid of points so that the clients, like for example the, the, the web scene viewer, can fetch only the data that is currently in view and on, only at the resolution that makes sense for the current like, uh, size that is displayed in screen. This is crucial because obviously if you have like one terabyte of data, you cannot stream that to the client. So that's what really makes us able to show uh, quotation marks, six billion points, where in reality we only may show a few hundred thousand points uh, that are appropriate for the current view. And now there are certain, that, like this points per inch is essentially a control that you can say how many points do I want to see on screen. The default value is 10, but um, you, can, you can lower this or higher this, uh, make a higher value. The higher the value is, the longer it'll take to load, but the nicer it'll look like generally. Um, and the clients may, and in fact the JavaScript API does have a hard cap on the number of points that we want to display because we want to make sure that like the low end computers don't explode and don't just like lock up when you add this kind of layer. So like even if you put a, a thousand in that value, we're not going to display like a gazillion points. Uh, that means that if you drive this value up too high, you may be experiencing some artifacts, like it may just stop loading after a certain point or it may have like irregularly spaced density. So don't go too crazy on it, but also like it won't break the app if you, if you do go crazy on it. So let's see what that looks like. Uh, let me reload so we're back in the RGB renderer. So that's a PPI snippet here. As I said, 10 is the default. Now I could go ahead just, just to, to demo it. I can lower it to one, but obviously this is not really something that you would probably want to do. Probably you, you want to go the other way and say, hey, my applications is actually like, everybody that's using it has a beefy line and have a, has a beefy computer, so I really want like a, a much denser um, display. And so you can raise it, for example, to 40 points per inch. All right, still loading. All right, so that controls the density of points, and then the next property controls the size of each point. Uh, so this, this property called point size algorithm, and it, there's, there's two modes. One is called splat, and one is called fixed size. The splat one automatically tries to pick a size of points that will make it such that you don't see too many gaps. So it, it computes the point density within the, the node or within any given like, part of the screen. And then it picks a size that, such that it's kind of a reasonable default uh, to look at. Uh, you could think like, let's say we have like a, um, 100 points in a certain square. If we make the points too tiny, there will be large gaps between the points. If we make them too large, they will overlap a lot. Uh, so you have to kind of find that nice middle ground that, that supports that kind of visualization that you want to do. And the splat tries to do that automatically, but you can go in and configure it, like tweak it by yourself. Uh, so by the way, splat is the default mode, so if you don't want to tweak it, you don't have to actually specify that property. But uh, you can add a scale factor, which essentially just um, blows up or, or, or makes it smaller. And, and a minimum size that the points will never go below. Let me show that in, in action. All right, so here we go. I'm, uh, I'm assigning the point cloud render. Uh, I'm blowing up the, the number of points here, like the, the point density that, that, that I display that shows the, the, um, the splats nicely. And here in this example, actually, oh, yeah, okay, that's bad timing, I guess. Let me, let me talk it, about it on the slide then first. So, so the splat one automatically tries to figure out what should the point of the size be, and it'll do so adaptively, depending on how many points are where. The fixed size one just assigns a single size to every point. But that size can be either in screen units, meaning pixels, or it can be in map units, uh, or actually this, this is meters always. So if you specify use real world symbol sizes, if you, if you turn that to true, then the size that you specify down here will be an actual real world size, meaning that the further you are away from the point in the view, the smaller it'll be. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Uh, so first example is, I've blown up the, the point density, I use fixed size, I use screen size points, but I make them really small. So this creates this like fine representation, kind of gridded. 
It might actually be helpful if I switch to a different base map here. Just try to do that. And I could go further and even try to load some more points. But now you can see it, it loads much further in the back because it needs to download many more of these like little pieces that the SLPK contains. All right, uh, I could uh, make the points a little larger. Then you can see it starts filling in these gaps. But if I make them too large, then it'll also like start to look, look more like an impressionistic painting rather than an actual data. All right, and then let's try the uh, real world size as well. Uh, now we need to think. Meters, 20 meters probably too, or most certainly too large. Let's try 0 0.5 meters for now. And now you can see that the points here in the front are much larger than the, the points that you see back here. That's because they, they now have a, actually a, a size that is, corresponds to an actual size, yeah. All right, so that's the, uh, the point size algorithm. So these two together, the points per inch point size algorithm, you can set on any render as a further customization to the display. Now, uh, for user interaction, uh, uh, I, let me briefly talk about that. So this is the sample, again, from the plenary this morning. Um, all right, let me reload that so we have the other render. OK, so when the user clicks on a point, you can get an event from the JavaScript API. This is the click event. Let me try to find the source code here. This is that one. That event will give you only the screen location of the point that was just clicked, so no information on what the user has actually clicked on. The reason why we do that is because it's potentially expensive to compute um, what is actually beneath that point. So we don't do it automatically. What you can do if you want to know what it is, is you can call hit test and pass this to that screen point. So hit test in 3D will shoot the ray through the scene uh, at the point that you clicked and find the, front, the frontmost intersection, so the frontmost object that intersects that ray. And it returns then it a hit. The hit or the hit result is actually an array, so it's um, in the I'm not even sure what the state is in 2D API. The idea is that at some point you will be able not only to get the frontmost hit, but actually all of the hits that are within that array, even the ones that are occluded. But right now you will only get the frontmost hit. So we can expect this thing to only contain a single hit right now. Um, and here I'd like to switch back to the slides actually. The, the hit result has two, point, two things in it. It has the map point which is the location in map space or, or in, in like real world in the projection that the view is in. And then it has a graphic. Now in the point cloud case, we kind of fake a graphic. We, we do return a graphic that only contains a geometry that has a point in it, which corresponds to that point, to the location of that point in the point cloud. So there's a difference between the two. When you click on a, at a certain location on screen, the resulting map point will always project back to that point. So this is really a point along that ray, right? But you may be, the, the points have a certain extent and you may not be clicking in the center. So what the result that graphic geometry returns is actually the center of that point. It's a point that is stored in the last data set. Whereas the, the result that you get in a map point may be a little bit off. We just wanna make sure that that map point projects back to the original screen point that you fed into hit test. So it depends a little on what you wanna do whether you're worried about, like you can go back and forth between map point and screen point with projecting and non-projecting and you always get the same point, or whether you're interested in getting the actual data from the point cloud data set, in which case you would want to use the geometry. Anyway, in that sample, uh, 
I'm using the map point because it was shorter to write down and, and easier to explain. Um, and then, yeah, the rest of the sample, it probably doesn't really belong in that session, but we created the terrain data set at that location. And once that's done, it gives us the point down here, point down here on terrain. And, and then I, we, just, we can compute the difference and annotate it here and draw a line from points down to the terrain. So this is a very basic kind of measurement that you can, also do, you can already do. You could also let the user select two points and then compute the distance between these two. Uh, you would have to work out the math yourself, make sure you're, you're computing the distance uh, like geodesically or whatever, but, um, but you could do it. But as I said, like we're, we are going to work on a measurement tool. So if you're pay willing to wait, then uh, just wait for it to happen. All right, so that's, the, uh, that's kind of the only interaction that we have right now. And this also concludes the, the sec sec section on point clouds. Uh, the section on integrated mesh will be quite short because there's not so many capabilities yet. Right now, we can only do display and explore and the same kind of user interaction that you've already seen with the point cloud. So you can also get an event, do the hit test, and then you get the, the point on the integrated mesh. The layer is integrated mesh layer. I can uh, have a, a short demo here. So this is a data set of Girona. And I mean, creating that layer or adding it to the scene looks very similar to, uh, to the point cloud layer, except this time, instead of using the portal item, I'm giving a rest endpoint directly. But then it's the same deal. You create that integrated mesh layer, you add it to a map or a web scene, and then you create a scene, you attach it to it. And then you get the integrated mesh layer here in the scene viewer, or sorry, in the JavaScript API. There's one maybe little trick that I want to point out. Sean has already mentioned that with point clouds, you get that problem of, potentially the problem of terrain, the terrain data set poking through the points. If they're not exactly, um, for example, if the, the terrain data is pretty rough and the point plot data is really fine, then you will get disagreements. And with integrated mesh, that would be really kind of disturbing. You really don't want the terrain to like cut through your street in the integrated mesh data set. So here we currently pull a, a kind of a rendering trick, which you can see if I zoom in here at the border, I need to find a place where it happens. I think it happens here. You can see around that area here, there's a little bit of swimming. What happens is that this point here is actually below the terrain. But we just do a rendering trick to ensure that the integrated mesh, oops, will always be rendered on top of the terrain data set so that the terrain will never poke through. And that causes a little bit of swimming here. The further down your um, integrated mesh is below the terrain, the, the more it'll be noticeable. Actually, if this is done loading at some point. Yeah, I don't know if it's there yet. But, um, so, so you might notice that effect. If you're wondering about it, that's what it is. The, the problem is, uh, it's just at the border, there's currently no good solution to make these things uh, match up really nicely. You won't notice it when you're navigating within the integrated mesh, but at the borders, we have to live with this kind of uh, artifact right now. Yeah, it's hard to spot. I'm not sure anymore where is a good place to, to show it. But anyway, I mean, if you don't see it, great. If you spot it, now you know the reason for it. Cool. So that actually is all I wanted to say um, about how to use it in a JavaScript API. And now I'm happy to take any questions about that. Oh, sorry. I forgot one last thing. Um, for integrated mesh layers, we have a couple of things on the roadmap. Uh, I won't make any promises right now of, of where they're going to come, but we are working on, or we are planning to work on surface symbology so that you can, all, similarly to Point Cloud, for example, we'll have a stretch render where you can, uh, in Pro, you can already do that, actually. We just don't have support in the, w in the web platform yet. So you can color by height, color by uh, classification, these kind of things. And the, the other thing is we want to make it possible to put, use an integrated mesh as a ground layer. So essentially replacing the terrain layer and using the integration integrated mesh only and being able to drape uh, graphics on top of that integrated mesh and elevation align uh, graphics with it. So, so this is coming up sometime in the future. We're working on that. Cool. All right. So now I'm ready to take your questions.
can you use uh, can you do some subterrain modeling uh, would JavaScript API allow you to go underground basically so um, there's in the API currently the only way to do it is in a local scene you can um, clip the scene to a certain extent. I can pull up a sample of that. Now, if I only knew. Yeah, that's the one. So you can see this is a, a local scene. It's a custom projection. And it's clipped to this extent here. And in that setting, we allow you to actually go underground and, and to navigate a scene from underground. So you can put data underground here. This would work just fine with point, point clouds. However, um, that trick I just mentioned about the rendering may cause Funny artifacts. I, I've never actually tried it. It would be interesting to see. But actually, you're probably not so likely to get integrated mesh data sets underground anyway. That, that, but for point clouds, there should be no problem. By the way, in the scene viewer, there's also a mode um, in the base maps. You can see, you can click uh, see, see through ground. And then we will render the terrain as wireframe. And you can see through it, so you can see the things that are underground. We, we don't expose that officially in the API yet. That's probably going to come pretty soon as well. All right, well, yeah. Is it possible to draw uh, lines between two points? Sorry, the API? can I draw lines between two points? Oh, yes, absolutely, yeah. Uh, this would work very similarly to what I showed. I mean, this is not point cloud layers here. This is just point features. But um, it, it works just the same as the, the other sample. You, you first get the click event. Then you do a hit test on the first point. And then you could click on a second point, And then you could draw a line between them. Or uh, if you know, now uh, let me just think. Yeah, if you know, for example, the object that is, you can do a, a query. So yeah, that wouldn't work for point clouds. <laughs> um, so if it's a feature layer, scene layer, you could also do a query like, OK, I want to find my two points and then fetch those points and draw a line between them. In point clouds, currently, the only way to, to, to get data is when a user clicks on a point. Then you can get the location of that point back. That's currently the only way of interacting with it. All right, yeah, well, if there's no further questions, thank you very much for your attention. And, uh, have fun at Dev Summit. Thank you.